right? So uh, my name is Zain, Zain as in Z-A-N-E, Zain Pear, coming from the islands of Trinidad and Tobago, as John said. And um, accompanying me on this session here today is my my uh, aunt and partner in ministry, Adrian. She'll be the one actually posting the scriptures excerpts that we'll be dealing with. And also my girlfriend, Kelly Key. She's also a ministry minister, in, min, uh, partner in ministry. And she will actually be pretty much monitoring the chat windows to make sure that we have no questions or comments that I, have, that, that I may have missed. All right, so without further ado, um, we will first acknowledge our dear and holy Father before we proceed. So Father, we thank you. We thank you as your sons, your beloved sons, and we thank you as our beloved Father for everything that you have done for us, for this marvelous plan, this marvelous foresight that you had, this generous heart, extravagantly generous heart that you have towards us, your son, that you sent, that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, to die. And Lord Jesus, we thank you directly also for your sacrifice, for your selfless sacrifice, sowing yourself that Father would reap so many sons. We thank you, Father, for us being your workmanship in Christ Jesus. And so as we divulge into another aspect of who we are in you, in Christ, hidden in you, we invite we we, we, we we actually surrender or hand the session over to you, O Father, to, to, to the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, you teach. And in the name of Jesus, every demonic hindrance hindering the participants of the session as we proceed and divulge into the study, um, we command you to go now and do not return. And in Jesus' name, I speak and decree life, spirit of understanding and wisdom to every participant here and to those that would come in, in Jesus' name. Command every prince of darkness to stand down in the name of Jesus. The session will proceed in the presence of the Father right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we begin basic identity two. Now, in basic identity one, um, Diana did us the pleasure of actually posting basic identity one session for those of you who may have may not have actually encountered it. Thank you very much, Diana. <clears throat> All right, so we go. The basic identity one is actually specific to being in Christ. We identified what took place from a, from a mechanical perspective in the construct of, of, well, in your construct as sons of God that actually identifies you as a son of God, how you will transition from being in Adam to in Christ. All right, in the, tonight in this session, we'll be covering actually your existence your, uh, as, as holiness. All right, so imagine for a moment that we are playing a game of Jeopardy, right? The music is playing in the background and you choose the category Jesus Heals and the host reads the excerpts that goes from Matthew chapter 14 verse 35 to 36 and when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought into him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Alright, so hold one sec, folks. Give me one second. Alright, so as we were saying, right, so he, he reads Matthew 4, chapter 14, verse 35 and 36. And, right, so he then looks for you, he, he then looks at you for your answer. Now, if your answer is what is faith, well, for most for most people, when actually they read the the, the passages of the New Testament, 
they actually see the Jesus actually operating. First, the first question that you'll actually first, if you if for most people, if, if you ask them, how did healing take place? The first answer is usually faith. Right? How many of us could attest to that? Right? The common understanding is faith. Everybody here? Yes, it, yes no. I don't know. I thought about it. <laughs> All right. So we have nine people on the call. So short, I I just want to actually um reiterate. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that uh, this these sessions are actually an open forum. We're actually divulging and discussing uh these sessions are actually studies. So I kindly I kindly ask everyone to feel free. If you do feel if you do have any questions as, as you proceed, kindly unmute. Ask your questions. We prefer to have these the sessions as an interactive session. I always say I do I prefer and do not like actually feeling feeling like, like as, as 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 if I'm lecturing. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of understanding, so let's reason it up. All right. So most people actually say, then what is the the, the answer to the to that Japanese question is what is fit? So then I have a question. Uh, if Jesus had faith to heal them all. Then, what was the case of the woman with the issue of blood? Jesus wasn't even paying attention to her. And as a matter of fact, whilst he was actually um, consciously busy with other persons who was taking place around him, the power just went out of him to accomplish it. In her case, Jesus was not actively applying faith in in, in, in praying in prayer nor laying hands on her. Now according to Luke's account he was basically oblivious of her presence and only realized what had happened and the moment that it happened. So maybe sometimes with, with respect to um, the, the, that in the, in the Gospels you may be asking the wrong question. So the question that you should really be asking is with regards to the woman who had this issue of blood as well as those mentioned in Matthew chapter 14 6. What in the world was in their minds to think basically the same thing. How is it possible that they would literally think the same thing? What stimulates a thought like that? When we actually, uh, when we say thing or a thought like that, what premise makes one think about touching the hem of the garment? What do you all think about that? Why would more than one person on separate occasions want to touch the hem of the garment? Okay, they heard something about it. Anybody else? Maybe like a testimony. All right, all right. Guys, feel free to unmute and, and give your response. You don't have to write. If you want, if you feel more comfortable writing, feel free. But you're at liberty to unmute. So testimony, anybody else? Well, I think the same Zen. She heard the goodness of Jesus about uh, Jesus healing the sick and uh, uh, doing the good things. So uh, she heard the word and Jesus' word. That's what I think. All right, all right. Lovely. Anybody else? So we're actually narrowing in here on. So we, we know that the, 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 the news of Jesus being the po potentially being. The, the, the Messiah going around Israel because all of the prophecies actually indicated that at the fullness of in, in the fullness of times that the Messiah will be there. So we know that they were expecting the Messiah, they were looking around. And as a matter of fact, there were more than one person around that would go um that would go proclaiming proclaim, proclaiming pro, proclaiming themselves to be the Messiah. But what we actually identify in here is what makes them think about touching the hem of the garment. Alan, you say you choose door number three. What's that? Yeah. So the question is, what do you think made them all think the woman, what is your of blood, as well as other excerpts where he actually went into certain villages and they actually just reached to touch, to touch the hem of the garment? 
Zing, can I just clarify the question? Uh huh. Okay, so what you want to know is why did they think to touch the clothing, not necessarily right. Jesus? Oh, okay. So I'm thinking yeah. it's maybe because the the priests they knew the priests that were set apart in the temple that worked in the temple wore those special garments. Okay, okay, I like that answer. Lovely, hold on to that. We're coming to that. Uh huh. Anybody else? Come on, come on. I would say that she heard, she believed, and um, she also knew that he was holy, so to by touching his garment, um, you know, that um, she touching, you know, Christ, I mean, she's touching Jesus as being holy. She saw her healing. She believed that she saw her healing. And she knew that just by touching him, that she will be healed. All right. Lovely. Okay. So, love. Um, all good answers. So, let's actually now divulge into that aspect of it in particular. And we'll see as we move along that. Faith is involved, but there's another factor involved. All right. So the answer to that question really is, what is holiness? Now, if you all remember clearly, Jesus was in fact referred to as a rabbi. And if a rabbi, therefore, he is or was a Jew. And a Jew among Jews. So this in particular is very instrumental in understanding the life of Jesus as a circumcised Jew and his cultural perspective. Now, a, a culture that is shaped by the Torah or what we call the law, the sacred writings and the prophets. Um, if, even the Apostle Paul was a Jew. Uh, he called himself in Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, a Hebrew of the Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee. And therefore, even more so, um, shaped by the culture of the nation in which he was groomed. Now, for those of you who may be familiar with the Jewish culture back then and even today, um, when you were born under the, the law of Moses, on the eighth day, if you realize that was done with Jesus in Luke chapter 2, on the eighth day, according to, Levit to the law in Leviticus chapter 12, you're required to stoop. Uh, to circumcise your male sons. After that, um, with your respective ritual practices, and after that, the after that the second requirement was in fact that you um, start memorizing the law. So from ages six to ten, you are actually required to attend, just like in our school in our. Um, school system uh, in, in our school system now we have lower levels higher levels and then tertiary education back then you had at six to ten you were you required to memorize the torah in hebrew word for word that had to be memorized that was actually the first requirement of the law after you were circumcised and so on from ages if you actually continued you would continue from ages 10 to 14 to go to, to proceed to memorize the prophets and if you chose to continue, you would actually, or if you were chosen to continue after the, the second stage, you would actually go and look for a rabbi to actually follow, for you to, in particular to continue to be, or in your aspiration to be one day a rabbi. Now, if you didn't actually continue from one stage to the next, you most, in most cases you, you dropped off and you would actually pick up a trade. Hence... Peter, um, the disciples, they were actually fishermen, trade. Jesus also had, didn't actually complete the entire schooling system because we know that he was a carpenter. And for that reason, you'd realize that when Jesus was actually walking around, healing the sick, preaching in the synagogue and so on, the Pharisees frequently asked him, under whose authority, under, on what authority are you doing these things? That's because he did not go through their traditional cultural educational system does that make sense to everyone everybody following that yeah 
All right, so in light of the fact that this is actually these guys, Jesus, the disciples, and even Paul, was actually came from a culture, from of a niche, from a nation that was um, that had its own its own practices, its own traditions. It is utterly ridiculous to know this fact, reject it, and then proceed to give the Bible our own interpretation or perspective. If these characters were Jews, then obviously they speak from the perspective of their culture. Now, according to the Torah, the law of Moses, to be more specific, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, as I said, the Jewish society, after having been circumcised as the initiation right to the covenant of Moses' commandments, were required to memorize the entire book of the law. Right? What we are actually familiar with as Genesis to Deuteronomy and what the theologians call presently the Pentateuch. Now, this was mandatory. And when I say mandatory, I mean national law. Every Jew, therefore, shared common knowledge as well as common understanding on matters and themes regarding the law. Holiness and the theme of holiness, which is the theme that we'll be covering tonight, is among them all. Right? So let's look at so let's look at this closer. Let's begin, as per usual, with definitions. So in the Old Testament, the Greek word, sorry, the Greek, the Hebrew word holy is actually the word Kodesh. Right? That word Kodesh, as my Aunt Adrian actually just posted there, it's actually in, in the chat window. Kodesh there meaning a sacred place or thing, or even sanctity. In the King James Version, is actually translated as consecrated, dedicated, hallowed, holiness, and also holy, even saint, sanctuary. That is in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Greek word that is actually translated as holy is hagiasmos. That means purification, purity, concretely, or even a purifier. In the King James Version of the Bible is actually translated as holiness, also translated as holiness and sanctification. Now, we constantly, within our church culture, actually use this word holy and holiness very loosely. But it is actually, it actually, um, the, 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 the theme, holiness, revolves very strongly in the Old Covenant. Now, how many of us are aware that, of, the, of the fact that the term holy or holiness in the Bible has four general applications? Four general applications. And I said she didn't know that, okay. Anybody familiar with the four general applications of holiness? Is actually, the first is, is actually applied to people. Alright, so for scripture reference, you can actually look at Leviticus chapter 8, verses 1 to 10. Alright, nicely, my aunt just posted it. Dejan just posted it there for you all. People, you can actually refer to Leviticus 8, 1 and 10. Places. Ezekiel 42, but, uh, verse 13. Things. You can also look at Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 to 10. And also time. And most of us actually know the Sabbath day in the law of Moses was considered holy. So we know that a day, time, is actually considered holy. Now, do you know? Next question. Do you know that despite what has been popularized by the general church doctrines, that the concept of holiness is not limited to morality? So here's the question again. Do you know that the concept of holiness is not limited to morality? Okay, Diana said she had no idea. Anybody else? In the popular church doctrines, it's very limited to morality. You think that, okay, you need to live holy. Well, that is just actually, I can safely say, 50% of the entire equation. After tonight, I guarantee you, you would look at yourself very differently. Be, your, be, you, be, be you holy as I am holy. Yes, that's true. Yeah. But after we explain tonight, then you know, Alan, you'll realize that that be holy as I am holy has a lot more weight and not what people actually thought it was. 
that is B, not do. Exactly. Exactly. So let's look into that. Now, there's another aspect of holiness that is emphasized tremendously in the law of Moses. Right? Tremendously. Which is imperative that, that the saints today comprehend. Unfortunately, it is not emphasized and I believe it is actually contributing. I will boldly say this based on my own personal experience actually uh, coming to this understanding. Our lack of understanding in, in this area is actually contributing to um, walking in the full perspective of Jesus, which I am not saying that I am there as yet, but it actually is something that is instrumental in understanding how Jesus and the disciples, as well as Paul, would have the lens that they were actually looking through. And also, it is actually responsible, I know for a fact it's responsible, for a lot of um, demonic attacks that saints tend to suffer. But what I, what I, I tonight, I'm sure that this will actually become a lot clearer. All right. So this is actually the 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 aspect of holiness of holiness that is emphasized in the law of Moses that is not frequently emphasized is what was referred to in those videos today. If you all took a look at the videos, the prerequisites is ritual purity. Now, moral purity was important in the laws of Moses, in the law of Moses, but does not in any way comprehensively define the fullness of purity or holiness. Moral purity, as we know it in the Western world, and is frequently emphasized in the Western world, is in fact just half of the equation, as I said. As a matter of fact, an entire section of the law of Moses, that is the book of Leviticus, is dedicated to purity or holiness, and technically has nothing at all to do with morality. Or sin, as we uh, emphasize in the Western Church. Now, ritual purity. Anybody familiar with that? Moral purity and ritual purity. Sounds familiar. You may have heard it. Never heard this before. All right, lovely. So, ritual purity, in some in summary, as elaborated in the Book of the Law, specifically Leviticus, basically revolves around remaining clean. And what do you remain clean of? What in particular do you remain clean of? Were you required to remain clean from? Unholiness. But what is unholiness in this case? Yes, Alan, exactly. Dead things or anything related to death, which technically is unholiness. Now, if you are unclean, that is, in, that is infected by anything that was related to death. The holiness of the Lord in the Old Covenant. What was the effect of, 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 of being unclean in the presence of the Lord? What was the effect death exactly? That is exactly why the, 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 the high priest, when he goes into the Holy of Holies, they would tie actually a rope to his foot with a bell. So if he goes into, if he goes into the Holy of Holies and he stops moving, they know most likely... He has collapsed, he's dead, and they will pull him out. Right? Now, according to the law of Moses, someone will become ritually unclean or impure, rit unclean, impure, or unholy, are pretty much the same things. There's three different ways of saying the same thing. Let me say that again. Being unclean, impure, or unholy are three different ways of saying the same thing. So according to the law of Moses, someone will become ritually unclean or impure in various ways. What are some of those ways? Anybody familiar with that? I'll give you a few, but just for the sake of let's discuss engagement, what are some of the things that will actually make you according to the to the to the law code, which the church frequently holds on to so tightly? Eating the wrong food, uh-huh. So we had unclean food. Anything else? Touching the dead. Exactly. Anything else? And the book of Leviticus is very, very detailed with this. Blood. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. All right. So I'll give I'll, I'll give a few others. One, skin diseases. Right. For example, leprosy. When the Bodily fluids, yes, John. Sickness, yes, Kelly. 
right? One was skin diseases, right? As you would have noticed, as you read the gospel, as as you may have read the gospels, you realize that lepers were kept far, and actually in that culture, when a leper was approaching, he actually had the necessity, the, necess the, the, the requirement to to um to shout unclean when he's approaching. That's because anyone that comes in contact with him would become unclean or unholy. Secondly, genital discharges would make you unholy, unclean. A corpse, as, as my brother Elijah stated, a dead body, all right, would contaminate a person. Menstruating women, handling of the ashes of the red cow or on the day of atoning of, of atonement offerings. Right? There we have it in the chat window. These are just a few. Emission of semen made you unclean. Contamination by a carcass. If you actually touched a dead person, you actually continue, continue to con sorry, consider to be unclean. Secondary contamination. That's what we're referring to. And as Diana also indicated, eating unclean foods. <laughs> okay, Shari, <laughs> we will do that in Jesus' name. All right now, listen up. Ritual purity was, was not necessarily sin. Ritual impurity was not necessarily sin. Everyone following that? Does that make sense? Ritual impurity was not necessarily sin. Sin was in fact related to moral purity. But the things listed rather, sim rather simply made you unfit to come into the presence of God. In other words, one could have been sinless, but physically impure or unclean. Making sense? Anybody have any, 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 uh, any questions so far? If you do, feel free to unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh -huh. So, um, I, let me just say a scenario, and then you can tell me if what if it matches. So, some uh, there's a couple; and they're married. The woman is on her period. She is impure, but she's not in sin. Exactly. Okay. Or exactly. If, they, if they've had sex, they're married, so it's cool. But still, there's impurity. Awesome. Okay. You got it. Got it. Thanks. <laughs> All right, lovely, nice. So, in the eyes of the Torah, on the law, and you notice I'm actually referring to this because these guys, as I said, this was actually their culture. So, holiness and unholiness, purity and impurity, or being clean or unclean, basically had these two categories that we're actually identifying here, moral and ritual. In our Western culture, however, we have literally isolated and related moral purity to holiness and moral impurity to unholiness. If the if the co I, I, I also boldly say that if the comprehensive understanding of holiness and unholiness is not reconciled, which is Jesus' comprehension of the concept as a Jew, is his lens, you can rest assured that the manifestation of God's power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse the leper will not be as it was with Jesus nor will living in inconsist inconsistent health as Jesus live ever be possible. Now, in light of what we just explained, before I proceed, how many of us actually realize that everywhere that Jesus went and he encountered evil spirits, he referred to the evil spirit as what in particular? An unclean spirit. So, now that I ask that question, do you know, is, is it now making sense? As to why he refers to them as an unclean spirit, and we also take into consideration that if he's actually speaking to them, speaking to them and referring to them as an unclean spirit, an unholy spirit, or an impure spirit, then Jesus is actually speaking to the spirit from the lens and the perspective of holiness. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So obviously. We, if we want to be like Jesus, we need to understand what this holiness is. 
Everybody agree? <laughs> All right. Now, now, holiness is not limited to the cleansing and remission of sin, as we stated, but also very much includes perfection in body. Now, for those of you who actually watch the video, the, 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 the video that's actually specific to Leviticus actually explain this. Being cleansed from all forms of sicknesses, diseases, and infirmities, all forms of death. If anyone attempted to approach God whilst physically unclean, as we stated earlier on, the holiness of, the holiness of God would consume them. And you can also look at that in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Now, the very first time God and holiness are made synonymous in the Bible, now that we actually set some set that set that nice foundation there. The very first time that God and holiness are made synonymous in the Bible as we know it is where anybody familiar with that? Where do you, where do you think is the first time the word holiness is mentioned in the Bible? Guess at least guess. <laughs> where is holiness mentioned in the Bible? Uh huh. Yes. And in <laughs> that's a good question, John. <laughs> Yes, which translation? But actually, um, generally, the word holiness actually appears in the, in, in, in the book Exodus. Right? So actually, the first, way, the first place it actually appears in, is in, is in um, Exodus chapter 15, in a song of Moses, song, a song that was sung by Moses. So if you actually look at Exodus 15, verses 11, of the 18 verse song it reads okay so so pay close attention as, as we proceed it said it reads who is like you among the gods O lord who is like you majestic in holiness awesome in splendor working wonders now, this entire song is in praise of god's power if you if you are familiar with that's the song of moses this entire song is actually dedicated to Alan, um, take off. Yes, Alan, yes. Uh, yes, indeed. All right, so this entire song is actually indicated, is actually in praise of his power and the wonders of his power, which is also stated in verse 6. Verse 6 of that, of that song also states, Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O oh Lord, shatters the enemy. Now, in this song, what we, what I would like us to actually take into consideration here, the first thing that we want to take into consideration here, is that we see that power and holiness are paralleled. Right? In this song, if this is a song dedicated to to to, 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 to God's power, as I as I stated just now. The wonders of his power and this power and holiness are paralleled in other words power and holiness are one and the same right the very first mention of god's holiness as being related to his power or his glory is in this song now let's take a look at some more uh, at, at about i have uh, we, we have many references but i'm just going to actually use two for the sake of time tonight sidebar why right hand not left hands in and on what exactly are you referring to when you ask why right hand not left hand what in particular are you referring to well you just said that his right hand is going to uh, the right hand the power the right hand is going to is the strength you know so why the oh. right hand not oh, left hand I Actually, that that in that in particular is actually tied into the culture of the people, of the civilization. No. <laughs> yes, they were left-handed people. Um, Alan, that is actually tied to the culture of, of of the people in that civilization, in the sense that um, it was understood that the right hand, in particular, was the hand anything that actually dealt with the right hand of the king, in particular. Right, right hand of friendship. Right hand of friendship, it was also is always recognized as something good and something glorious. Thank you. Yeah. Um so we are as 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 we were saying, we're actually looking at two more references here. 
Let's go to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 15 to 21. I could have someone volunteer to read Isaiah 14, verses 43, sorry. Verses 15 to 21. Yes, Elijah, that is so. Right? Actually, a lot of the, the, the Muslim culture today, the Arabic nations actually take their laws as um, it comes straight or is heavily influenced by our Babylonian king that is actually referred to as Hammurabi. And all of the, that is actually cultural practice. Right? So Isaiah 43, verses 15 to 21. So we just wait on my aunt Adrian to post that excerpt there for us, and I will kindly ask anyone to read that for me. Uh, is it up there? Uh, your right hand, O Lord, is gracious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Awesome. Exactly. <laughs> I was just making sure that those were the right ones. Yeah. All of actually all, all, all of those scriptures that you're referring to there, actually that 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 verse, and all others actually refer to the same thing. That cultural understanding that the right hand is the place to be. It is actually um considered even in some in some of those cultures, you extend your left hand and it is considered disrespectful. It's just um it's just a cultural practice. Okay. All right. Okay, so I will post this here. My Aunt Adriana is actually experiencing some technical difficulties. So here we are. Isaiah 43. This is 15 to 21. So if anyone actually um volunteer, just kindly unmute and read that excerpt there for me, please. Sorry, verses 15, 15 to 19, I'm sorry. 15 through 19? Or 16? Yes. Okay, so, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horses, the army and the power. They shall lie down together, they shall not rise, they are extinct. They are quenched as tow? Oh. Remember ye not the former things, <laughs> neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing now. It shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? It will I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And just as a side note, let's go back to Amplified. <laughs> <laughs> I like Amplified better. But yeah. okay, so there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> all right. So what what we actually highlight in the scripture, if if we if we follow the the the, the context of the scripture, we realize it actually says, "I am the Lord, your holy one." All right, and it actually goes on as many scriptures in the Bible, which actually to to parallel power to holiness. So it says in verse seventeen, which bring it for the chariots and horsemen, the army and the power. So here is another scripture that actually is referring to military power and um uh, and and the actual power, the dunamis of God is actually tied into holiness. Everybody seeing that so far? Yeah? Everybody following that? Nice. Another scripture verse that you can look at. Isaiah fifty five verse five. Right? Um Shelley, would you like to read that scripture there for us, please? Isaiah 55 verse 5. If you have some technical difficulties with the mute button. I know you just mentioned that phone is stressing you a bit. Okay. glory. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. Hello? Hey, Shelly, you, you, you just actually um, feel, feel it out there a bit. Oh, sorry. Um, are you hearing me now? Yes, I'm hearing you loud and clear now. You see, thou knowest not a holiness to glory. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. A nation that knew not 
shall run. And to be the church of the Lord is our God. And, the ho- and for, ho- for the hope we want of Israel. For he has grown by thee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right, so you notice again in this verse, we see that holiness is related to glory. Yeah, it says unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Everybody following that so far? Nice. Lovely. Now even Jesus, we know through his conversation with Mary, prior to Lazarus, prior to um, Lazarus' resurrection, he equates the glory of God with the power of God. Do you all remember that? The glory of God with the power of God. In John 11, chapter, um, John chapter 11, verse 40, Jesus said, as you see here, Jesus said, to, Did I not say to you, if you believe in me, you will see the glory of God, the expression of his excellence. And that was actually manifested in Jesus by the power of God resurrecting Lazarus. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Diana, you come, you come you back to the um, Amplified. I actually was not aware that I um, placed um, King James excerpts into, the, in, 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 into this manual. Yeah, so you see here that actually we have the power of God and related to the glory of God. Everyone seeing that? All right, so we see that these, the words power, glory, is actually being interchanged. They're one and the same. All right, so these all show that holy, holiness, based on this, the, the passages that we just covered, holiness, glory, military status, which is the army, and power are all one and the same. They are all manifestations of holiness. Make sense? I have a question. Uh-huh. Since you just mentioned power, I was thinking about the scripture that said uh, the women are supposed to have power on their head from the new somewhere in the New Testament. I remember exactly where it was. One of the letters, um, I think that Paul wrote. Now, the power that the women have on their heads is that just is that their hair, or is that supposed to be like a hat? Power on their heads. You you do do you remember which? Um... I'll I'll look it up and I'll get back to you. Yes, please. I'll, I'll appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, yes. So everyone following this, do we have any questions so far? Any questions? Come on, guys. Don't be so don't don't be so quiet. We see that holiness, manifestations of holiness so far, glory, power, right, and even military status. Everyone following that? All right. Now let's turn our attention now to the New Testament. So let's go to the one of the Apostle Paul's letter, the letter to the Romans, chapters chapter one, which is one to five. Okay, well I will actually post that excerpt there. Okay, all right. And if you all will kindly um, pardon the delays because my my aunt Adrian her computer was actually giving us some some difficulties just now. All right, so would, so would someone else actually unmute and read Romans 1, verses 1 to 5, me please. Uh, Romans 1, um, 1 to 5. Um, That's actually Paul, a uh-huh. Go ahead. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle or special messenger, personal, personally chosen uh, representative set apart for preaching, the gospel of God, uh, which is the good news of salvation, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the sacred scriptures, um, or the good news regarding his son who was to the flesh, um, that is his human nature was born, a descent of David to fulfill the covenant prophecy, promises. And as his divine nature according to the spirit of holiness was openly uh, designated to be the son of God with power in a triumphant and miraculous way by his resurrection uh, from the dead 
is to see uh, Jesus Christ, that's to say Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, it is through him that we have received grace, amen, and our uh, apostleship to promote obedience to the faith and make disciples for his name's sake among all Gentiles, amen. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, zoom into verse 4. It says, and to his, as to his divine nature, according to the spirit of holiness, was openly designated to be the Son of God with power. Are we seeing that? So do you realize that in this excerpt again, among the many passages of the Old Testament that, that actually um, parallels holiness with power, that even in this letter, that the power of the Son of God is attributed to the spirit of holiness. So here we see basically that power and holiness again are equated. So we can, comfort, we can comfortably say that power equals holiness and holiness equals power. Everybody following that so far? Right? I will actually give you one more excerpt from the New Testament and that's Acts chapter 3. Everybody following? Everybody's quiet tonight. Just indicate, yes, I'm here, I'm listening. But, or is it my Skype is stuck? I don't think anyone at all. Did I ju just actually indicate yes or I'm following just so that I know that you're all actually hearing me and everyone is following? Jim, hello? Uh-huh. <laughs> Sorry, I was about I was about to say that um the the chat your chat is probably stuck because everyone is responding in the chat. Oh ho! Oh boy! All right. Okay. Uh, are you seeing any questions that uh, that anyone asked that I should um, address before we proceed? I'm sorry, my phone gives me a few seconds before I respond. Um, no questions. All There's right. the verse posted, the verses, sorry, Acts chapter 3, verses 2 to 12, and um, oh. Diana says, I'm following, Elijah, yes, making notes, Alan, yes, tracking you. <laughs> Diana right. says her chat has been stuck too, so it's probably not just you. Alan. Okay, okay. So the, la the last thing I'm seeing here is the, is the, is, um, the posting of the excerpt from Romans that we just read. Oh, okay. No, it's, it's way beyond that. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So I guess Skype in the name of Jesus. Skype work well. Flow freely in Jesus' name. All right. So with someone else, actually, I'm um, as Kelly mentioned to me, I'm not seeing Acts chapter three verses two two to the twelve posted here. So as you're seeing it, with with someone actually um, volunteer to read that excerpt for me, please. I'll do it. All right. Thank you. You betcha. Uh, Acts 3, verses 2. And a man who had been unable to walk from birth was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, so that he could beg alms from those entering the temple. So when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking them for coins. But Peter, along with John, st stared at him intently and said, Look at us. And the man began paying attention to them, eagerly expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name, authority, power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Begin now to walk and go on walking. Then he seized the man's right hand with a firm grip and raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became strong and steady. And with a leap he stood up and began to walk. And he went into the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, 
and they recognized him as the very man who was usually sitting begging for coins at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement and were mystified at what had happened to him. Now, while he was still holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly amazed, ran together and crowded and crowded around them at the covered porch called Solomon's Portco. And Peter, seeing this, said to the people, You men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as though by our own power and godliness we had made this man walk? Amen. Thank you very much, my holy brother. All right, so zoom in here again to verse 12. All right? It says, And when Peter saw it, he answered to the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this, or why look ye earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness? All right? Um, the version actually that John was reading was actually said godliness. The same Greek word is actually translated as godliness there. It's actually holiness, power, or holiness. Everyone seeing that? So here we now have an, an either or reference. Power or holiness. So again, power and holiness are pretty much paralleled. Everybody seeing that? Everybody following that? Is this getting interesting? Yeah? All right. So the letter to the Romans, in the letter to the Romans, it actually says power according to the spirit of holiness, which we identify as the Holy Spirit, and the letter to the Acts says power or holiness. Now this of course calls into question the significance of the Spirit of God being called Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Holiness. Question. In in the context of what we're referring to here, why isn't he predominantly known as the loving spirit? Or why didn't the apostle lay hands on the disciples and say, okay, be baptized in the peaceful spirit? Could it be that there is a massive significance in the context of what we're actually saying here behind the spirit of God that is given to us so freely, being called the Holy Spirit? Right, so maybe the answer to the century's mystery to life in Christ lies in understanding a simple but profound question that, of course, that we may have missed in the Western Church. The term Holy Spirit has been has been used so much in the Christian arenas and so cliche that no one really questions why or what is it, or, or what is the significance of saying Holy Spirit and not just Spirit. Why is the Spirit of God emphatically and predominantly called Holy Spirit, particularly also in the New Testament? Right? This is not so in the Old Testament. So the question is, what changed? In the Old Testament, we refer to the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God. In the New Testament, he's, he is actually emphatically and predominantly called the Spirit of Holiness or Holy Spirit. Right? Elijah says holiness being wholeness or blessedness. Yes, Elijah, that's all part of it. That's all part of it. So in the old covenant, true. So in the in the old covenant, when you actually were found to be unclean, impure, or unholy, for those of you who may, feel, who, who may be familiar with the the first five books of the Bible, and in, in particular um, the book of Leviticus, when you were found to be unclean unholy or impure what were you required to do in the old covenant to to actually be restored to, to, to a state of purity or for a sacrifice exactly to be more specific you actually had to act, you actually had to undergo what is referred to as a purification ritual now follow this very carefully don't miss this at all so in the old covenant through purification rituals one was made holy once again and that is actually both morally and physically. And you knew. <laughs> that'd be John. <laughs> yeah, John, that, that, um, 
that that would be a challenge in the rules, right? <laughs> right? So in the new covenant, <laughs> in the new covenant, Jesus's blood has um, pretty much replaced that. For us in the new in the New Testament, what has made us holy? What what has actually replaced the purification offering? I just give you the answer, Jesus, and what, and, and, and in particular, the blood of Jesus. Everyone following that? Right. I'm, I've tried to put this as actually as briefly and as compact as possible because we can go a long time actually going through this. So let's take a look at actually um, Hebrews chapter ten, verses nine to ten. Hebrews 10 verses 9 to 10. So in the new covenant, Jesus' blood has served as our eternal purification offering. And the Spirit of God has become our eternal holiness. And both spiritually and physically. Right? Hebrews chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. Um, Kelly K, could you kindly unmute and take and read that verse for me, please? Those two verses for me, please. All right. Sorry about that. Um, my screen is... Just giving me a little... Okay, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, right? Right. All right. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. And so he does away with the first covenant as a means of atoning for sin based on animal sacrifices, so that he may inaugurate and establish the second covenant by means of obedience. And in accordance with this will of God, we, who believe in the message of salvation, have been sanctified, that is, set apart as holy for God and his purposes through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed once for all. Awesome. Thank you very much. So we see from this, from, 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 from this excerpt here that Jesus' is blood, the body of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, is actually our sacrifice once and for all. Everyone seeing that? Is that clear? So technically what everyone actually in the Old Covenant, the saints of the Old Covenant actually had to undergo regular, regular rit ritual purifications to maintain a state of holiness and purity or a state, a state of cleanliness. Jesus has actually covered once for all. Now, is it actually coming into perspective why the Holy Spirit is actually referred to as the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Holiness? Is this making sense? Is it coming into perspective? Any questions at all? all right, so Alan, what what we are, what 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 we're pretty much referring to is the fact that in the Old Testament. The um, the entire um, old covenant is actually centered around the presence of God, and the presence of God is what the old covenant referred to as holiness. So what we're simply saying is that when the oh, the first covenant, the old covenant, was actually inaugurated, the the um, the Israelites they were actually given very strict stipulations as to what to do to maintain a state of holiness both both um, morally as well as physically to be able to dwell in the presence of god making sense so when they actually became unclean or they actually touched anything that's related to death they they are um, they were actually said to be by by the law said to be in a state of uncleanness or unholiness and they would actually go through regular purification rituals to ensure that the presence of god does not take their life that they do not die in the presence of god in our case when jesus came jesus actually was the sacrifice once for all so now Pull it, pulling it into perspective by Jesus' sacrifice. Um, do you all remember the, that when Jesus died, that they 
the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn. All this ties in one into the next. You all remember that? But when Jesus died, the veil was torn. Right, from top to bottom, yes. Now, by the tearing of the veil, taking into, taking into consideration that to actually maintain contact or to be in the presence of God, one was actually um, required to undergo ritual purifications to maintain a state of holiness, to interact with the presence of God. What do you think that the tearing of the veil that separated the presence of God from the rest of the temple, the, the, uh, the actual presence of God, the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple signifies? So I'm asking the question again. We have more, now access to the holy place now. Yes, Elijah. The tearing, the tearing of the veil that actually served to separate the, the resident presence of God, the Holy of Holies, exactly then, and no more separation. Which means through Jesus' sacrifice, the presence of God is accessible and is actually filling the entire earth. It is now accessible to all by the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus. So now, those who are actually covered, or actually, um, we go directly to God, no priest. Yes, Alan, no priest. And Mary says, our separation from God, right, our separation from, from God has been removed so that the blood of Jesus actually serves to get to actually bring you directly into the presence of God. Right? This is actually stated in, in, um, in Hebrews chapter 10. Let me just post that verse there for you all. Hebrews 10. That's 10, I believe. Verse 19. Alright, so here we are. Yes, thank you, bro. That's this, this Skype is... So let me pull that back up. Right, those are the two verses. Thank you very much, bro. Those are the two verses I was actually just trying to copy and paste. Excellent. One spirit indeed. All right, so it says in verse 19, Therefore, believers, since we have confidence and full freedom to enter the holy place, the place where God dwells by means of the blood of Jesus, by this new and living way which he initiates and open for us through the veil, as in the holy of holies, that is through his flesh. Right, so what we're actually saying, Alan, is that the blood of Jesus being shed took the place of the purification offerings of those for the, of the Old Testament. And now by the blood of Jesus, we can now receive holiness. And we receive holiness by actually receiving the Spirit of God who is now unto us the Spirit of holiness. Does that make sense? Yes. No, no more rivers of animal. No, exactly. No more, no more rivers of animal blood. So, uh, everyone following so far? All right, so we just made... Re we just Excellent. All right, so, so we, just, we just identified that the glory, the power, and holiness, according to the scriptures of the Old Testament, as well as the excerpts of the New Testament, you can, actually, you can also find additional excerpts in, in Hebrews also, Hebrews 12, that actually identifies holiness with the power of God. So, now that we've actually made that clear um question now the apostle peter in first peter chapter 1 verses 15 to 16 quotes from the law leviticus chapter 20 verse 7 saying that god is holy now we understand that we have been made holy by receiving the spirit of holiness question what does holiness look like we know that we made holy but holiness actually literally has a substance what exactly is the substance of holiness what does it look like some jeopardy music here now <laughs> unblemished yes uh-huh go on uh, yes it's unblemished but what makes this on what's what makes it unblemished revelation one Mark says my revelation more pure purity has a purity has an appearance john and diana what is that purity? What what exactly is it? It is it is our nature. 
but it has an appearance. What is the appearance? It's all over the Old Testament. Like glorified Christ. Kelly K, what do you mean like glorified Christ? Door number two, please. Alan, what do you mean by door number two? <laughs> Mark Pear said light. Um, yes, it is light, but what is the light coming from? What is the substance of the light? This is what we want to get at here. Spirit. Yes, Stephen, that's true. But the Spirit is actually the Holy Spirit. Spirit, Jesus, is actually the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of holiness has an appearance. Now, by identifying this, we identify our substance. What I'm simply saying is, we know in the in the in the on earth that our substance, our our body actually has a substance of flesh. In the spirit, we have a substance. All right. So somebody, it's the glory of God, Diana. The glory of God has an appearance. What is that appearance? That is what we want to get. We want to get to the root of that. Mark Pierce says the sun. Kelly yes, also says the sun. Yes, you're getting closer to it, but I, that's not exact, exactly the word I'm looking for. Shining. What is the shining, Alan? What is the shining coming from? You all are actually all saying the right things, but we want to get to the root. And Mark and Kelly Key actually said the sun, which is actually closer to the answer. Moses' face shined, okay. We're actually trying to get white light all right white light from what elijah said transform body that transform body is the substance of something the throne the th not really the throne in this case but yes the throne has the same substance actually the holy spirit mary we actually saying the holy spirit is, is also the spirit of holiness so what we are actually trying to ascertain here is what is the substance of holiness what is the what is the appearance of holiness? What is the root of its appearance? Thinking Kafka on, guys. Now, um, two people, Mark and Kelly, actually said the sun, that which is also correct. What about the sun? Is would be considered holiness. We give it 30 more seconds. Glory. Alan, glory has an appearance. All in the Old Testament also. No problem, Mary, no problem. Glory has an appearance. Brightness. Diana, where is that? what is that brightness coming from? What is that brightness coming from? What substance? God himself. Elijah, it is God himself, but God is actually has a physical... Uh, uh, no, I, 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 I would not say a physical, but he was... Um, it's not physical, but it, it is an appearance. It is an appearance. It's all over the scriptures, guys. When they, when Moses met God in the wilderness on the bush, what did he see? Kelly K says the rays of the sun. Yes, you actually get into the right answer, but I, I want to get what he is exactly. Elijah, fire, fire. Yes, it is fire. All right, the substance of holiness is in fact fire. Exactly. Yes, Alan, the bush burned. But it was actually on fire, but wasn't being consumed. Alright, so let's take a look at this. Now, with um, Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Now, there are many scriptures in the Bible. These are just a few excerpts that we're going to look at here. To actually now begin to narrow it in to what you are in the spirit realm. Right? Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. I will read this. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire, a blazing flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was on fire, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I must turn away from the flock and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned from the flock to look, 
God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then God said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet out of respect because the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So the first excerpt we're looking at here is actually showing that the blazing flame of fire, the presence of the fire, in the presence of the fire, the ground or the radiation of the fire is actually considered holy ground. Well, for those of you actually involved in the Ephesians chapter 6, when we actually dissected the armor, we also made reference to Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 that actually said that the dunamis, the power of the sun, was actually a shining. And today we are actually seeing here that the power and holiness are the same. So which means that the shining of the sun is the sun is the sun's holiness. Are we seeing that? Is this making sense? All right. Another excerpt, Exodus chapter 24, verse 17. As I said, this is all over the Bible. Exodus 24, verse 17. Auntie Adrian, could you read that verse for us, please? Um, in the sight of the Israelites, the appearance of the glory and brilliance of the Lord was like consuming fire on the top of the mountain. All right. So we see here, we just identified that the word, that glory, power, and holiness are one and the same. We actually identify that trend in the scriptures of the Old Testament, the excerpts of the Old Testament. So here we see here um, the glory, which we identified in the excerpts, the previous excerpts as holiness, and the brilliance of the Lord was like consuming fire. So here we see that glory equals holiness which equals consuming fire. Are the dots beginning to connect in your minds? Question. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, there's my mic. Um, you also had said military status. Is that connected with all of this too? Or was that? Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. I'm, I'm taking <laughs> notes, so just asking. Thank yes. you. Okay. <laughs> no problem. All right, so... Another scripture to take a look at, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 22 to 27. All right, um, could I kindly ask Stephen to read this for us, please? Okay, sure. The Lord, <clears throat> the Lord spoke these words with a great voice to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, and he had it no more. He wrote these commandments on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you approached me, all the leaders, heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he still, he still lives. Now, then why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer, then we will die. For who is there of all flesh, mankind, who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? You, Moses, go near and listen to everything that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us everything that the Lord our God speaks to you, and we will listen and do it. Thank you very much, my holy brother. Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're into verse 23. It says, And when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you approached me. So, Take note, mountain was burning with fire. Verse 24, and you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory. We identified glory before, again, as holiness. So we can also say the Lord God has shown us his holiness and his greatness. So glory, greatness, power, holiness, or glory, um, greatness, power, 
military status, all of this, all of these things are manifestations of holiness. And holiness is fire. Right? So verse 24 says, The Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. Verse 25, For the great fire will consume us. So holiness, again, equals glory, one and the same, which is equal to consuming fire. Everyone following that? This, all right, so uh, again, are the, are, are the dots beginning to connect? All right, Leviticus chapter ch chapter 2, verse 3. Leviticus 2, verse 3 reads, What is left of the grain offerings belong to, belong, belongs to Aaron and his sons? It is a most most holy part of the Lord, most holy part of the offerings to the Lord by fire. So again, holy fire. Holiness is fire. You can also take a look at in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 10. It says the same thing. Most holy part of the offering to the Lord by fire. Okay, we can also move that now and take a look at Psalm, move forward and look at Psalm 84 verse 11. Yes, Diana. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Perfectly. Right, so Psalm 84 verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. We cover this in the... Um, in the dissecting of the armor of God. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows grace and favor and honor. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Why do they refer to God as his son? In light and in the context of what we are actually going through exactly. He is a son because he is fire. Everyone following that? Let me just pause here for just one minute. Any questions? Please unmute. Feel free to ask your questions or any comments. Is this helping? Uh, I uh, just a comment. I uh, I was uh, with a prophet a few weeks ago, and he went up to heaven, and he said at least a half a dozen times when he, Jesus was he was holding or Jesus was holding his hand, he was saying, "Jesus is burning up my hand." He said that at least a half a dozen times, so that fits in perfectly to what you're teaching us. Awesome, 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 awesome. Anybody else? How, how, how are the dots connecting for you? Feel free to unmute. Question. Uh huh. So when we pray for healing for people and we have manifestation of heat in our hands or they have the manifestation of heat in their body, this is connect connected to that yes yes as a matter of fact um we can also research and you'd realize that actually the scientific studies that followed after the research of this well-known physicist or well, let me say physicist nikola tesla after the following up of his research they actually proved now listen to this. They actually proved that um, the rays of the sun was actually electricity on a different radio frequency. So they actually proved that fire is also electricity, hence lightning. So it's one and the same. Does, does that make sense, Diana? Yeah, it does make sense. You know, I remember reading something not too long back, too, talking about how, you know, our hands, that the palms of our hands, when they do research on it, that the, whatever the life that comes from us, the energy that comes from us, is emitted strongest through the palms of our hands. Well, so. <laughs> it has made a lot of sense, you know, lay hands well, that's why, because you get your <laughs> good connection going. Okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> yep. 
right? So there we see that the holiness of God is in fact the power of God. The holiness of God is, is in fact the power of God, which is the consuming fire of God, which is the glory of God. Yeah? So I'm saying that again. The holiness of God is in fact the power of God, which is actually the consuming fire of God, also known as the glory of God. The power and the glory of God are all the consuming fire of God, also known as the holiness of God. Therefore, upon receiving the Holy Spirit, we have become what Father is, as his seed. The Spirit produces sonship. So if the, 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 the Spirit produces sonship and we are Father's seed, fire produces just like a dog produces dogs, cats produce cats, humans produce humans, fire produces fire. <laughs> right? So we have become and exist as consuming fire. What I want to actually bring to light in tonight here, scenes, is that your substance in the spirit realm is not some invisible substance. It is actually consuming fire. You exist as fire. All right, I have a question. Uh huh. I, I prayed for a um, a a, um, a waitress in a restaurant one time. She had pain in her lower back, so I just mm. said, "I'm going to put my hand on your lower back," and I prayed for her. I didn't even say anything. I just prayed silently and then she said that she felt heat i never felt any heat now what was the heat was that that was obviously the holy spirit right but can you break that down so i can understand that um well when you actually when you look at it i covered this in one of the sessions before um i was, was absent. okay okay sorry about that <laughs> um the Holy Spirit is a spirit of power. Now, if you actually look at the word, um, um, word for power in Greek, dunamis. And then, are you aware of the fact that the Greek word dunamis is actually the root word for two English words? That's dynamite, as well as dynamo. We covered that the other night. Yep. Right. So the word dynamo. Dynamite is actually explosive, but the word dynamo is actually a generator. Gen okay. A dynamo is a generator, and dynamo is a generator of electricity. Uh -huh. So when actually, um, what actually, what you realize is that when you actually lay hands on person, a lot of times they actually they feel um, heat or they feel tingling. They f that is because you are actually now a generator of electricity, power, power, electricity, and fire. All actually electricity on different frequencies, and that's that's from the Holy Spirit inside of us. That's the Holy Spirit inside of you. He's the spirit of power. He's the spirit of dun dunamis. He is a generator of power. That same and he, power. Uh huh. And and he chooses how he's going how he's going to manifest healing, whether it's electricity or heat. Well, technically, is is one in the same in the sense that power. The same spirit of power is also the spirit of life. Now, if you actually even take a look at your physical body right now, you have a, you actually your body has a spirit, but the manifestation of the presence of the spirit in your body is electricity. Your heart functions by electrical pulse, as well as mm -hmm. all of your thoughts. All of mm -hmm. your thoughts are electrical pulses. If you remove the spirit from the body, there is no electricity. So if you actually look at that, you'd realize that the electricity in itself is actually what is animating your body. Making sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. So when you actually lay hands on someone, what you're actually doing is actually releasing life, power from the spirit of life, spirit of electricity of power into, in, into, the, in, into the body of the person that you're dealing with. And it causes the body in particular to quicken. So hence healing. So the, 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 the tissue in the body actually receives like a charge and the tissues begin to heal at a rapid pace. I believe that is why they refer to Jesus and the Holy Spirit as a quickening spirit also. So the enemy comes to kill, steal and destroy. So when, when, um, 
injuries occur to the body, it's from the enemy. So when we pray for people, we are bringing them back to life more or less through that electricity or that power. Yes. Yes. Okay. You are Thank you are you. Wow. you're releasing life electricity into the body to restore it to its natural to, to its previous state. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So actually if you if you do research with electricity, electricity and movement always generates heat. Energy and movement generates heat. Electricity and energy is also parallels. They are also parallels. So um, electricity and movement generates heat. I also mentioned in one of these sessions, you realize that um, in judges, there's actually an excerpt in judges where Samson was drinking water. And it also said that Samson drank water and his spirit returned to him. Which is no coincidence because if when you drink water or you, if electricity comes into contact with water, it flows through the water a lot faster and a lot easier. So when you drink water, technically, you actually say it all the time, you know, you drink water and you, and you, and you feel more energy, which is more electricity. The maintenance of the hydration of the body causes the electricity of your spirit to flow through the, the, through, through the body a lot easier. Make uh -huh. sense? Yeah, yeah, electrolytes. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> all right. So, yes, and it's also very good for your health, for, for your brain health too, because your, your brain actually functions by electrical pulses also. Yeah? Nice. So, any other questions? All right. Nicely. So, uh, where were we? No problem, Alan. No problem. Blessings, my brother. So, it's therefore, as we said, upon receiving the Holy Spirit, we have become what Father is, his seed. Right? So, we now exist as consuming fire. And I will show you how and where the Bible actually indicates that you do exist as, 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 as consuming fire. So, let's take a look at the New Testament. Right? We also just, to, just to actually look at one or two more excerpts because some of you may say, okay, we're well, looking at the Old Testament and it's actually saying holiness and fire in the Old Testament. Where is this in the New Testament? Let's take a look at that. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. Right. Um, could I, um, bro, Elijah, could you read this essay for me, please? Yeah, sure. Praise Thank God. You. Matthew 3, verse 11 and 12. Um, as for me, I baptize you with water because of your re repentance. That is because you are willing to change your inner self, your old way of thinking, regret your sin and uh, live um, and live a, ch uh, a changed life, but he, the Messiah, who is coming after me is mightier or more powerful uh, or more noble than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to remove, even as his slave. He will baptize you who truly repent with the Holy Spirit and you who remain unrepentant with fire or judgment. Thank you very much, my brother. Amen. So again, what is the Holy Spirit parallel to here? You know, we see this all the time in church, in the church arenas. Father, baptize me with Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit and fire. You're saying the same thing. Holiness equals fire. Fire equals holiness. The Holy Spirit, we can comfortably say, is the fire spirit. The spirit of fire. Are we seeing this? Some of you may ask, well, how come actually this is actually... Yes, John. <laughs> that, yes, John. Um, Art Montgomery actually uses that term, fire, fire, fire. I know that that comes from the Spirit of God in him. Because the Spirit is fire. <laughs> he is the Spirit of fire. It is the existence of fire. Right? Um, some of you may ask, well, how come actually Jesus is actually baptizing the Holy Spirit to those who are his and fire representing judgment. It is the same of the Old Testament. If you are unholy, sinful, if the same fire, instead of actually being glory and power to you, will be judgment and death. It will consume you. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? The presence of God among the sinful will consume them. So to, to the unrepentant, the presence of God, the spirit of fire, the presence of the spirit of fire brings judgment to them. But to those who are in Christ, 
or who will actually listen to the message that Jesus was preaching to repent. It was glory to them. How many of us are thankful that we are in Christ? <laughs> we have been. We, we are not facing judgment in any form or fashion. We are in the glory. Right? So I'll give you one more scripture which you have commonly read again, but probably never connected the dots like this. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. Um, Mark, could I kindly ask you to read this excerpt here, bro? Yeah, bro. Alright. Um, the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound, a sound came from the heaven like a rushing violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were being distributed among them, and they rested on each on each one of them, as each person received the Holy Spirit, and they were all filled, that is, dif diffused throughout their being with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues, different languages, as the, as the Spirit was given them the ability to speak out clearly and appropriately. Thank you very much, my brother. Holy brother. So, what is the parallel here again? The Holy Spirit came upon them, and what did they see? Tongues resembling fire. Fire. <laughs> again, now how many of us have actually read this excerpt here and not actually connected the dots and realized that holiness is fire? Yeah. Right? So, we can comfortably say. That the Holy Spirit is the fire spirit. It is actually the spirit of fire. Is, it, is this making sense? Awesome. Awesome. Hebrew, I'll give you one more. <laughs> I, I was going to actually give you the last one. But I'll give you one more. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10, verses 10 and 29. And Hebrews 12. 12 verses 10 verse 29 we won't read the whole excerpt from 10 to 29 so it says in verse 10 our earthly fathers disciplined us for only a short time as seemed best to them for he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness fast forward to verse 29 and it says for our God is indeed a consuming fire so since before we proceed before we actually now narrate in to us directly is this becoming clear that you exist as fire that you are the existence of that awesome Thane, can All I right. ask a question oh. Thane? Yeah, I'm listening. Go ahead. Oh, oh okay. I wasn't sure you heard me. Um, in yeah. Hebrews 1 7, it says, And indeed, as to the angels, he says, The one making his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Is he talking about the angels and do they have that same substance? Are they the same as us or is he talking about us as ministers? All right. So that's an awesome question, then. I love that question. The answer to that question is going to ruffle some theology. <laughs> Do you realize that... Well, follow me carefully. Do you realize that the same person that we're referring to as Christ is actually referred in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord? All right. Do you realize that in Revelation, when... Jesus, the Son of Man, gives the message to the seven churches. He calls the leaders of the churches, pastors, men, human beings, actually, that is actually, when I say human beings, it is men. 
as we are. He doesn't call them pastors. He calls them angels. He calls them the, the angels of the seven churches. It's in reference to pastors, or the leaders of the seven churches, but he refers to them as angels. Have you all seen that? As in messengers. Uh huh. But he actually calls them angels. And if you read through Revelation 10, if I'm not mistaken, the Son of Man is again referred to as a mighty angel. This is also the same in Daniel. Now, you probably sound, you, now when I was saying this here, it kind of it made me sound confusing. But <laughs> we are in the, I'm saying, let me see this here. Eh? I'm saying this openly, but I know this is going to ruffle a lot of theology, especially the typical church theology. The mere fact that the Son of Man, Jesus, is referred to as an angel, even in Revelation, also includes you. <laughs> yes, Alan, watch out. <laughs> Which means the reason why you can guide or lead the angelic army is also because you are also considered to be the head angel. Well, in Hebrews 1 7, what it actually refers to are the angels that actually are the angels that are subordinate to us in Christ. So the angels are also referred to as holy angels. So when it says angels, winds, and his ministers are flame of fire, the holiness on the angels by the Holy Spirit would also be fire. Does that make sense, Diana? But the angels are holy angels also. Brother, you're going to have to give me a couple minutes on that one. <laughs> now, Jesus, we are in perfect un union with Jesus. Now, I would challenge you all. Now, the, the, the angelic aspect of it um, um, was not intended to be part of the session here, so I'm just answering Diana's question. But, um... <laughs> um I would challenge you all. No, 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 no that's, that, that's good. Because I like, I like that you actually asked that question. I, I love, as I said, I love that when we do any sessions, that it, doesn't, it, it isn't a lecture. It's actually your reasoning. You understand? You're, you're reasoning the mechanics. I love that. That, is, that actually is a confirmation to me that, you know, the paradigm is shifting. But what, what I am, I would challenge you all. To actually go through the book of Revelations and of uh, Revelation and see that Jesus is referred to as a mighty angel more than once. Now that ruffles a lot of uh, a, a lot of church theology because they believe that angels are angels and God is God, but the angels actually also are created from God. So for can them, I, uh huh. Can I can I just throw a thought that just came into my head? Go ahead. Uh, I'm not trying to cause any problems here, but it just popped into my head, so I'm just going to throw it on the table. Scripture didn't Scripture say that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels when he was man? Right, but right now he is no longer lower than the angels. He's now glorified. Right. So I'm trying to understand that with us being angels above that the angels that we that you I can't how you how you just said that. That well, we're angels higher than the angels, or something like that, where the we command the angels. So I'm trying to put those two together. Well, put it like this. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, mainly, I don't mean to cause a problem. But... No, 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 no. Mainly, yeah. it's simply this: if angels are military beings, and you are also military, then look at angels as a actually. We can interchange you with angel with a soldier. Right, right. So it does not mean that you are actually, you are um, an angelic being. What is it? What it means is that you are actually considered one of them as in the context of a soldier. Because only a soldier could lead the army. Right. right. So Jesus actually, when he was born as a man, was... Um, was made lower than the angels, being as a man, because he is mm -hmm. actually 
he came to, to suffer as in, in the place of those that were in Adam. Right. But having, having resurrected, he resurrected into power. Glorified. Yes. yes. And, and as glorified, he's now referred, he's now, he left, he left the estate before where he's referred to as, an, as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Came into my, um, came as a man, lived as a man, lower than, than the angels because the, the, those in Adam were actually fallen men, died and resurrected and back into glory. Right. So for him actually to be the captain of the Lord of hosts, as, you, as we saw in Joshua, mm. it, would also, it would also mean that he's also considered, just as in Revelation, I think in Revelation 10 also refers to, um, refers to him as a mighty angel. Is, it, is, is that, are, 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 are you following the context there? Yes, he was restored to the glory that he once had. Right. He resurrected, right. Right, so the angels actually in Revelation 10, as well as um, in another, is another chapter of Revelation, they actually shout out to him and refer to him as a mighty angel. Hmm. It is not that he is an angel in particular, he is now in God's state. But for him to actually lead the army, he has to be a soldier also. He has to be the captain. Mm -hmm. The angel here would also would actually refer to military status. Is that making sense? Yes. Hmm. Any confusion there at all? Alan? No, I, I'm I'm tracking you. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we now actually as saints in union with Christ, being actually in the context of military leaders as captain of the of, of the army, would also fall into that category, even though we are not angels as in messengers. Is that right. making sense to everyone? Makes a lot more sense than what I used to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone following that? <laughs> yeah? You see, as I said, I, 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 I put, I, I, put out, I placed the disclaimer before that is going to ruffle a lot of church theology. <laughs> but it is what it is. <laughs> right? So, in response to Diana's question in respect to the Hebrews 1 7, they, because the angels are actually also holy angels, for them to be holy, they must also. Holy, if holiness is fire, then they are also fire. Does that answer the question, Diana? I know I gave you a little more information there, but... Okay, awesome. Any questions there at all? I, I, I know, I know, I know that would have rocked the arm, rocked some foundations a little bit. It's probably, this is actually the first time that I'm actually putting out that, 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 that type of information in public, eh? <laughs> Alright, so... Everybody else following? Just want to make sure I don't lose anybody. Just indicate, yes, I'm here, I'm tracking, following. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, Alan, you're unmuted. You, are, you, um, you have a question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll go back. I'm just trying to screw my head on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Alan, if you have any any um any confusions there, just, just feel free to unmute and and and, and ask it. All right. So so we know that. So let's now now actually um conclude it. Let's bring it in closer. Let's bring it in to us. So do you know that the glorified? So obviously we know that glorified Christ in us, Christ that has become us, is made of is made of consuming fire. His body is fire. So let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Right? Um, when I, his, eye, his eyes are flames of fire too, it says, right? Yes, and as well as his feet and hands. Hmm. Right? So, so um, Alan, would you like to read the excerpt there for me, please? Sure. Uh, let's see. Revelation 1, 12 through 16, the whole... Yes, the entire thing. Then, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and after turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. 
His head and his hair were white like wool, glistening white like snow, and his all-seeing eyes were flashing like a flame of fire, piercing into my being. His feet were like burnished white-hot bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was powerful like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment, and his face reflecting his majesty and the Shekinah glory was like the sun, shining in all its power at midday. Thank you very much, Allah. Thank Bless you. it. Amen. All right, so are we seeing the the parallels here again? What are the parallels here? Right, write them out for me. Write them out in the chat window. What are the parallels here? In the context of holiness, what are the parallels here? What are we seeing here that's actually identifying the same thing? White hot, uh huh. Anything else? Like a flame, uh huh. So we see in fire, the, uh, the, the head and his hair, white like wool, glistening white. So you can include glistening white. And glistening white like snow. And it's all, I, I know, you, you have to take into consideration that John here is actually seeing this and he is trying to find as best as possible the physical, the natural elements that can actually match what he's seeing. He's trying to act, he's trying to describe it. So he says his hair and his hair are white like wool, glistening white like snow, and his all seen eyes flashing like a flame of fire, piercing into my being. His feet were like burnished white hot bronze, which means that it is not cold metal. If you actually go and if you can if you YouTube if do if you YouTube bronze in a furnace you will be amazed to see how white it looks. I mean, I mean, bright white fire. All right? Refined in a furnace. And you, go, you come into verse 16 and it says, His face reflecting His majesty and Shekinah glory was like the sun, shining all His power at midday. All right? So here we see again that the parallel holiness, Jesus Christ now is holy, and his holiness is that fire. And all over him is actually white fire. Now, some of us may actually ask, okay, well, if, his, if it says it is actually, his face is actually shining like the sun, how is it that the fire is white? Yeah? Isn't white the hottest flame? The fire? Uh actually actually our sun now most of us actually to, to respond to your question alan um our sun actually shines yellow to us right everybody everybody actually sees the sun as actually shining yellow but question if the sun is yellow how come at night the moon which is the direct reflection of the sun outside of the earth's atmosphere is white Think about it. How come the sun reflecting on the moon? No, the, the, the moon doesn't the, the moon doesn't have actually have its own light, John. It's actually reflecting the light of the sun outside of Earth's atmosphere. No, so the question is how yes, Diana, it is the lesser light. But the question is, my question is, is, is in particular is this. We know that in earth that the that the sun looks yellow but at night the moon looks white it does not look yellow and the moon is actually the reflection of the sun the sunlight do you know that the sunlight and earth actually looks yellow only because it actually passes through the ozone layer our sun burns bright white Yes, ma'am, the gas is in our ozone. If you go and do some astronomical research, you'll, you'll actually realize that our sun burns bright white, which pretty much, with that scientific understanding, pretty much verifies the authenticity of revelation. 
Everybody following that? Don't take my word for it. Go we'll do some astronomical research, and you will see that the sun is actually white. Bright white. It only looks yellow when it passes through the Earth's atmosphere, starting with the ozone layer. Everybody is quiet with that there one. Well, with that one way. <laughs> Everybody following that, right? <laughs> The reason why the, the moon looks white as it is, it is because the moon is actually not inside of the Earth. It is outside of Earth's atmosphere. Photos of NASA, the sun burns red. Um, Elijah, actually, the, the red that they use on the Na um, that NASA uses is actually, uh, what do you call it, um, a particular filter that they use to eliminate the gamma rays. So you can actually see the fire on the sun. But that is not the actual color of the sun. A, that, 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 that is a particular filter that they use to, to be able to actually watch the sun without burning the retina in your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> right, they use many, many different um, lenses to do that. Right? Also, we can actually look at Malachi 4 2. We refer to the scripture many times in the Ephesian sessions. Malachi 4 2 refers to, to, to Jesus as the son of righteousness. It says, but for you who fear my name with awful reverence, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. So, Jesus is a <coughs> son. I always wondered why it was S-U-N, not S-O-N. Now I understand. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right, so the Lord, uh, as, Mark, as Psalm eighty four eleven says, the Lord God is a sun and shield. So Jesus, being the Son of God, is a sun. As I put it recently, He's a sunny sun. <laughs> right, and we as sons of God are sons too. Right, so the same Christ that is actually depicted in Revelation chapter one and is called the Son of Righteousness is now living in us. So since in light of um, before I before I say that, um, do, do, does anyone have any questions? I know, I know, I see. Like, I noticed that um, responses slow down a bit. I don't know if that uh, information rock the foundation a little bit. Bro. Uh huh. I have a question. This okay. question is um, based on the Egyptians, right? I know they used to do sun worship, right? Can we, can I say that their sun worship is practically because of the understanding that the sun is practically the son of God himself? But the sun, our sun, the star, is the son of God? No, no, not the star, the sun. And um, nowadays people misinterpret, misinterpret it to be the star our, that is in our galaxy. But maybe the Egyptians and their son worshippers, practically Jesus Christ himself, understand that he, in his spirit, is practically a son. S U N. Well, what took place? What I what I what I believe took place. To respond to your question, what I believe took place is that uh, when Adam, taken into consideration. We kind of ran off a little bit here, but just permit me just a few minutes just to respond to this question, please. When Adam, <coughs> um, when Adam fell in the garden, and we learned in the in the sessions in Ephesians that faith is actually mental acceptance as of what is uh, that something is actually true and real, mental access to what is true and real. And we take into consideration that Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, actually um, refers to the fact that our understanding of the hope of the calling, the wealth of the inheritance in the saints, and the enormous power that is in us, actually flows through, according to verse 16, the eyes of our understanding, and the Greek word there for understanding means the eyes of our imagination. Then we know that in Hebrews chapter 11, when it said, when it says that Abel 
offered by faith, which is the Greek word pistis, which is actually translated as credence. And credence is defined as mental acceptance of something being true or real. When it says by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice, then we know that, that, that Abel would have actually approached the presence of God in mental acceptance that is true or real, being through the eyes of his imagination, the screen of his mind. In the same way, Enoch walked with God and he said, by faith, Enoch walked with God and it, to, to walk, it is, without faith, it is impossible to walk with God. So if we, tra if we interchange the, the translation, without faith, the, without mental acceptance that it is true or real, Enoch, um, one cannot walk with God. Taking, in that, taking that into consideration, I, from, from what I, um, if, if we take that into consideration, I, the question is, how did Abel, being the second from Adam, the second, the second of his offspring, know how to approach God in faith? And so if we take that into consideration, then we know that within the earlier civilizations after Adam, they Adam would have taught that this is how he would, have, if Abel actually approached God by faith, then Adam would have, he would have learned that from his father, Adam. And so I, um, in response to your question, Mark, taking that into consideration, it is evident that the understanding of faith and approaching the presence of God in faith, um, that mental acceptance is true or real, was, was somewhat common knowledge amongst the descendants of Adam. I, taking that into consideration, I believe, you now this is just my opinion here, I believe that men who actually began that men who began to create idols and to choose the to choose the elements or the creation to worship chose it simply simply because they um, would have they would have had things taught to them that was handed down from from one generation to the next and because of the Adamic state they chose not just like Adam would run from the presence of God, they chose to evade the presence of God and apply their knowledge to the natural things. So it is possible that Adam would have taught because he was in contact with God before he fell that God is a son. And that information may have been transmitted because he, was, he had conversation with God. It is very possible that it was transmitted and those who now decided to evade the presence of God, they, they direct their attention to the, to the physical son. Does that make sense? Right? Does that make sense to everyone else? Yeah, everybody following. Just indicate yes. Just want to make sure everybody is following. <laughs> All right, Alan. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. All right. So we see that Christ is actually a son of righteousness and so hence the hence the description of revelation john knowing the scriptures of malachi chapter 4 verse 2 as a circumcised a previously circumcised jew would have known that the son of righteousness is actually the son of man is a way of saying the son of man so he would have known that jesus in his glory is a son and so he tried his best to, to use natural things to describe what he was seeing and so if we see that malachi chapter 4 verse 2 actually refers to him as a son of righteousness then we know that this glistening white hair and the flame of fire piercing into my being and the his feet like burnished white hot bronze refined in a furnace and his face shining like this with the shekinah glory was like the sun shining all his power at midday all his dunamis at midday then if Christ, the same Christ that is mentioned here and, if, and described here is the same Christ that is in you, what are you, brothers and sisters? Fire. Yes, you are. You exist in the spirit realm as fire. You are holiness. You have been made holiness. Right? Does that make sense? Everybody following that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad to know that, Alan. 
right? So we are made holiness. So my question to you is, can Satan touch fire? Just like unholiness cannot approach God because it will be consumed. Just like our physical sun, nothing can approach it because the heat of the sun will consume it. The holiness of the sun, the power of the sun will consume it. Unholiness cannot approach you. Yeah, that is why in, in, in Psalms it says that the enemies of the Lord melt like wax in the presence of the Lord because he is fire and he has made you fire. Right? The Holy Spirit has given to you is the fire spirit. So let's now tie that in and wrap up. So we actually refer to, now many of us would say, well, that is actually our spiritual state. But let's take a look at something. This consumer's fire is not all limited to your spiritual reality. In the acknowledgement that holiness is both moral as well as ritual, that is spiritual as well as physical, let's look at this excerpt from 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. It says, uh, can I ask, is Michael, Michael Woodworth, can you, are you available sir, to read this excerpt here for us? Yes, I can. Oh, yeah. Amplified, whoops, hey, yo, we don't, okay, it says 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. Uh, do not, probably, do you not know and understand that you, the church, are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells permanently in you, collectively and individually? If anyone destroys the temple of God, corrupting it with false doctrine, God will destroy the destroyer. For the temple of God is holy, sacred, and that is what you are. All right. So here we see that the holiness is not limited to your spiritual being. Hmm. It's actually limit is actually extended to your physical being. Everybody seeing that? Holiness is not limited to your spiritual being. It's also extended to your physical being. If you are holy, your body is also holy. In the old covenant, for one to be deemed physically holy, a purification offering had to be done. Not so. But in the new um, everybody following that? In the Old Covenant, purification offering had to be done. In the New Covenant, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Right? Um, Diana, can I kindly ask you to read this excerpt here for me? Please. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was wrong on my, my chat. Okay. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17? No, 6, chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Okay, that hasn't come into my chat yet. Okay, here, here it is now. I've been having a delay, too. It's weird. Okay, do yeah. you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. Awesome. Thank you, my holy sister. So here we see that in the Old Testament, we went the, Jew, the Jews and the Israelites, they went through their purification offerings to be holy. In the New Testament, you have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus, and your body is also now holy. So in Christ, the reception of the Holy Spirit makes you both spiritually holy and physically holy. You are spiritual fire, and even though you are seeing flesh on your on your bones, that is also recognized as fire by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We are free from darkness and death, not only in our spirit being, but also in our souls, as well as our body. Your body is also holy, and if holiness is consuming fire, then your body by the Holy Spirit is also consuming fire. Nothing unclean unholy or impure can touch it or come near it. Does that make sense? Is everyone following that? 
nicely. Now, so we revert our first question. I'm going to, I am going to ask this question. Yes, John, sickness is a lie. It is a lie. Your body is actually consuming fires holy, and, and any form of sickness is actually unholiness. So it is actually a lie. <clears throat> so, so in the spirit realm, we, the 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 enemy can see see us in the spirit realm, see our holiness. Yes, sir. Can see our bright, can see our brightness. Uh huh. And. And and we're given specific. How should I word this? We're given specific like levels of authority in the kingdom, okay. and that even occurs now. Okay. So, as we continue to rise from glory to glory, our brightness in the um it, it, it continues. It, it gets brighter. Not, I mean, or or we saturate ourselves in scripture. You know what I'm saying? Like, how does this? How do we? I I think I understand what you're asking. I think your I'm, answer, I'm confusing myself here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think your answer is in Philemon chapter one verse six. Where? Philemon chapter one verse six. Okay, I got to go there. Right. So your authority is standard. The, what actually differentiates you from the person that is actually walking in glory and the person and the same that is not is Philemon chapter 1 verse 6. It says that the communication or the release of your faith is made effective and powerful by recognizing what Christ has done in you. Yes, yes, um, Diana and John, renewing your mind, acknowledgement. Simply put, a saint can live his entire life and because he does not know what he has been made it is not activated in other words your soul is literally the valve to activate it or to keep it dormant does that make sense alan so if we say we grow from glory to glory it's not really an increased light because the light is standard and is given to all saints your increased glory is increased acknowledgement. Does that make sense? Re increased renewal of the mind. Yeah? So, coming back to what we were saying here just now, you have been made fire. You have been made consuming fire. You exist as consuming fire. Right? To walk in this is to simply acknowledge it and to walk in its and the awareness of it. Now, this will actually now bring into context why the children of Israel will actually see Jesus and want to touch him. Before I will actually, um, that aspect of that, that to answer that question, stay tuned on the same back channel, <laughs> on the same Christ channel. Next week on the tenth of 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 um the tenth of this month, next week Thursday, I will divulge into the mechanics of holiness, and you will see how awesome you are, and how you can actually make an entire atmosphere holy, and just cause people to touch you, and become clean, holy, and healed. All right. So to conclude today. This session today was actually to just bring you into the understanding of your existence. Next week, next week Thursday, we will we will actually go into the understanding of the mechanics of holiness. Holiness has mechanics, and it's in the Bible. All right. So here tonight, we just have a few activation exercises. I would we just like to. Um, use some simple exercises to help you now begin to apply this to you practically. So first activation exercise, we know that the eyes of our spiritual eyes are the eyes of our imagination. So my aunt Adrian actually just posted that there. So I'll guide you all. We simply just 
apply these simple exercises here, simple act activation exercise. Everyone following so far? Before we begin the activations, what do, do we um do we have any questions? Comments. Feel free to unmute. Give your comments, your questions. This is the fun part, the activations. Connecting the new knowledge and making it your reality. Any questions? Just one more call for question. Going once. Any comments? At least one comment or two comments before we begin the activations. How does this how, how does this new knowledge impact you? Come on guys, just unmute. Anyone? Don't have don't have me pulling teeth here. <laughs> Do I have to You know, Zane, I'm uh -huh. sitting here trying to kind of like collect my thoughts because there was a lot in this and yet I know that over the last few years a lot of this has been coming to me as well. It's almost like um there were a bunch of fish in my head and you tonight you got a net and you gathered them all together and pulled them to oh. my thoughts. And I'm just trying to give you a picture because I have so many different things going on in my mind right now. Because some of this I have already known, and then my question comes up, well, if I already know this, am I acknowledging it? Maybe that's, I guess, where I feel like, am I missing something in the acknowledging part? Okay. Or, or what? Or, or, do you know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. trying to be clear, but I'm not very clear myself right now. Well, I, 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 is, it, is it that um, you may have um, come across bits and pieces of information, but not... Um, was not settled, totally settled because... That's a that, good way of saying it. Yeah, because you, you only actually walk in the reality of it when your mind is settled. If you're not settled, you're double-minded. All right, so g give us, how do you settle it? We got to settle this because we want to be just like Jesus did, did what he did. We have to do what he did. We have to send the enemy where he belongs to go. We have to heal people, all of that stuff. So what's what's the secret? Well, <laughs> how do we how do we settle this? Well, the set the settling the set the, the first aspect of the settling is, is what we just did. I walked you through the scriptures, well as compactly as possible because as I mentioned to go through it in detail. Well, we, we can be here a while. So I actually did this as compact as possible. So that's the first the first the first step of settling it. Seen it in the scripture, you saw it for yourself. I posted it. I posted the the, the excerpts. So you can't say that Zain said this, it's all in the Bible. Once that is actually settled scripturally, then the next question is how you actually apply it. And that actually includes faith. Now, faith in particular, let me explain this. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of vagueness and ambiguity with faith. If you actually um you will be um, you will be amazed. As we covered it, as everyone here that actually participated in the, in the Ephesian studies, you'd be amazed how, with a concordance and a, and a dictionary, how you can decode the, the all the smoke and the grasping in the wind that, that goes on in the religious arenas. So if you actually look at faith, the Greek word pistis, it is actually translated as, translated as credence. Credence is defined as the mental acceptance as being true or real. The mental acceptance that something is true or real. Related to 1 Corinthians chapter, sorry, not 1 Corinthians, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, it actually points out three things are actually accessible via the eyes of the imagination. The first is actually knowing, coming to the recognition or the expectation of his calling which is Christ in you. Secondly, is the glorious inheritance in the saints. And thirdly, is the immense power that has actually raised Christ from the dead that is in you. All of those three things flow through the eyes of the understanding, which is the Greek word dianoia, which is actually the eyes of the imagination or the screen of the imagination. So to actually, your second step after you've actually done it, you've, you've, you've done the study, you've seen that this thing is what it is in the scripture. Now we're actually going to, the activations here are actually designed to, to connect your knowledge and make it now your spiritual reality. 
So you have accepted it as true and real. So what we're going to do here now is simply first, if, if, if there are no other questions, we can proceed straight into the activations. And then I will actually open the floor for any other contributions or questions. All right. So firstly, I want you all to just pause for a while. Right. We have just acknowledged that you are holiness because you receive the Holy Spirit and you exist as fire. All right. Now, this, as I mentioned earlier on, is actually one of the one of the things that completely changed my experience in Christ. I personally believe that a lot of saints actually they get involved in the spirit realm, they do certain things, and then they actually have negative effects or adverse experiences with demons and, and demonic attacks simply because they don't know this what we this simple yet it is uh, let, let me say hidden in plain sight <laughs> information and they suffer adverse attack uh, adverse they have ex adverse experiences like they they experience demonic attacks simply because they do not know that their existence and because they don't know they cannot acknowledge it, and if they can't acknowledge it, they can't have faith in it. With this here, I have I have actually lived since I understood this is actually now about about two and a half years since I came to the understanding of this, and it revolutionized my experience as a saint. I in the Pentecostal um, arena that I actually were be, were in before, not to bash the the Pentecostals, but it was always a struggle with demonic attacks. And as soon as this settled into me, that was it. I literally experienced walking into rooms and demons running. They don't stand around. Because I, I have actually acknowledged it as true and real. So your first, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone to just pause for a little while and look into the eyes of your imagination. Go into the screen of, into the screen of your mind and acknowledge your existence. So I want you to actually look, uh, go into the screen of your mind and see yourself made of white fire, like the sun. See yourself as glistening fire, actually made of the material of white sun. You're solid, but actually you're solid because your, your substance is white fire. Your substance is holiness. Everyone doing that so far? Now, according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, everybody following so far? Everybody in the screen of their mind? Just indicate yes. You're seeing this fire. White fire. You are, you are ablaze. All right? And this white fire, just like the sun, you're shining and you're filling up the entire earth right now with white light. It's shining from you. Everybody following that? Okay, I'm now seeing the messages. Oh my. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay, Diana. Take it in strides. I'm now seeing the messages. So you can actually start like that. So you're seeing yourself as made of white fire. In the, in the screen of your imagination. You can start with your room. Fill the room. The entire room is filled of white light. All illuminated by you. Right? Extend it to your house. Then extend it to your neighborhood. So the entire neighborhood is, 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 is lit by your white light, by your holiness. Extend it into the skies. And for a moment, in the screen of your mind, look at Earth from outside of the planet and see the light filling the planet. It's white. It's bright. It's white. How are we going so far? Good. Awesome. Everybody else following? Okay, I must be an idiot. I got my eyes closed. I see blackness. Am I supposed to be seeing a picture of myself against a black background and then seeing myself like 
emanating like a white ray. Is that what we're saying? Is that what I'm supposed to be doing? If 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 that works for you, Alan, that that's fine. But don't actually um, you actually you, you you're using your imagination here, right? So you're actually going on the screen of your mind, on the eyes of your imagination, and you're seeing yourself first. It's it's perfectly normal if, if you actually at first you um see that black background. That's awesome because that gives oh. you a, a background that you know can actually fill with your light. Okay. Right. So, okay. so you're seeing yourself as that white fire in, in, in your imagination and now fill the area and see yourself, see, see the area being filled by your white light. So everything is actually going to be illuminated. Okay, I'll work on it. All right. So Hebrews 11, chapter, um, chapter 11, verse 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which in the Amplified actually says faith comprehends as fact, what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. So if we actually interchange faith with its definition, it will say, now, mental acceptance as true or real is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence, the physical evidence of things spiritually seen. So what we're going to do now, I, I don't know how, 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 um, how are you coming along so far? Just use your imagination. I'm trying to find my imagination, I think. No, it's, 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 it's nothing that's actually that you're working at. Um, generally, when you, um, generally, when you think, a lot of people actually don't realize that when they think, their normal thoughts start off as mental pictures first. If I actually tell you, Alan, go to the gate right now, the first thing that's going to come up in your mind automatically, without effort, is a picture of the gate, and you're going to proceed towards the gate. Okay, that's easy. Right, so it's the same thing. You're not oh, going to try to, yeah, you're not laboring to do it. It's the same thing. You just, your thoughts oh. are picked up. Okay. All right. So, take into consideration, it says it is the physical evidence of the spiritual realm. Your next step. Now, I want you to sense that fire on your physical body. Right? Just acknowledge the spirit of holiness. Yes, John, that's an awesome picture right there. That's an awesome. Right, so pause while you're in imagination and you're seeing that imagination. Now I want you to sense that fire on your physical body. You don't have to feel heat, but just sense the presence of the Holy Spirit on your body. When I say sense, I mean become aware. This is nothing spooky. Just become aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit, that holy fire, that white fire on your body. If you want to look at your hands and see that in the, in the screen of your mind, your white fire, feel free to do that. Do you mean the Holy Spirit in us or on us? In, in and on, both. I, I must be trying too hard. Okay, I'm just gonna listen. <laughs> just, um, Alan, just relax. Don't, don't, um, don't, don't try to labor it. It's just actually you're using your normal imagination as you usually you usually do your normal thought processes throughout the day by actually thinking and you see what you want to see. That as, as I mentioned just now, I might say, Alan, pick up the pen and you actually have a mental picture of the pen. And you go look for the pen. It's the same process that you're using. There's nothing labored. It's your normal God-given um, imagination that you're using it. All right. So you, 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 as I said just now, you want, you want to become aware of the Holy Spirit on your body, and see, see the Holy Spirit on your body as that um, white fire consuming white fire now for those of you right now that may, may that may have for example pain or you get in difficulty with a particular uh, which you, you may be experiencing difficulty whilst you're doing this yes auntie yes auntie Dejani, it will begin to tingle you might feel heat some people for those of you who may be feeling pain Right where you are, as you're doing this, 
This right here is what the Old Testament refers to as acknowledging the presence of the Lord. So for those of you who may be feeling pain or in any way or, or any way some, somewhere, whilst you're doing this, if you get up and you begin to do something that you couldn't do, you'd realize that just by doing this, acknowledging this holy fire, your pains will leave. But what you're doing is acknowledging the spirit of holiness, which is the spirit of fire. If we touch, if we touch the cloth, is that the is that you know, like the anointing goes into the cloth, and you can give it to cloth or someone, and they'll get healed? Is that what we're talking about here? Actually, um, Alan, that was what I intend to um, to cover next week Thursday. But to answer your question, that is how holiness works. Anything, okay. anything that touches something that is holy becomes holy. That is okay. why I, I can actually take up a pen and give it to you. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. Okay. Thank you. It, it's actually transferable. It's tangibly transferable. All right, so both hands are... Diana is actually saying both hands are warm. Awesome. So if anyone in the session here has pain or may be feeling or may, or may be sick, just actually begin to move and do what you couldn't do and you're going to begin to see that there's going to be rapid right now rapid recovery by acknowledging holiness in your body right so whilst we're doing this next step whilst you're doing this now i want you to acknowledge in the screen of your mind watch at yourself as the sun shining through the entire earth or your or your room the neighborhood the state that you're in shining through the earth and acknowledge that no unclean spirit, no unholy spirit can even approach you. Just as, they, just as you feel the heat on the earth at the sun at 96 million miles, devils cannot approach you. They run. They hide because of your holiness, because of your fire, your consuming fire. You are sun. White sun. All right, it's me again. I got another question. Uh -huh. So, well, so if somebody says I have pain in my back, am right. I supposed am I supposed to think this way that that there's I'm, I'm, um, that that there's holiness in me and it's exude, it's it's coming out of me? Am I supposed to like put my mind in that mindset? And then pray for somebody, and they're going to get healed. Well, actually, Alan, what what um this is what we're doing here is trying simply, to break it down. Yes, yeah, I, I love that you're asking those questions because it's it's actually questions that a lot of people struggle with. Um, yeah. the these exercises that 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 we're doing here is actually for your benefit, as uh, in Christ, to actually step into what Christ has made you. Now, when you're actually ministering to people, what I usually do that works wonderfully is actually, you know, this what I'm about to explain to you here is actually something I'm going to do in actually the Basic Identity 3, which is going to come up very soon, before the end of this month, on the presence of the Lord. One of the common themes in the Old Testament is that even Paul and all of the, the apostles, they actually identify or acknowledge the presence of the Lord before they actually begin to move. It's all over the Bible. So what you can do when, 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 when you begin to, if you're actually going to pray for someone, what works wonderfully for me in particular also, is I simply acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in me and around me and even on the person that I'm dealing with. There's nothing how, how, do you, how do you acknowledge him? Do you, do, you, do you, like, speak to him? How do you do that? What you do is actually, is actually um, a, a conscious awareness. So you can actually become aware of the Holy Spirit. Like, um, let's say, for example, uh, let's say, for example, you're sitting in your room right now. And guys, just give me one minute. Eh? Just continue right there acknowledging that holiness in, in your body. Why is I respond to Alan here? What you can do, Alan, is that, like, you're sitting in your room right now, 
And we know that the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Lord is in all of the earth as well as in you. So you can actually start with a simple exercise like sitting in your room, just be still and acknowledge the presence of, of, the, of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in the atmosphere. Now, a very good example is this. Do you realize that if most people go into a haunted house, they become very aware that something is inside of the house and they expect something to take place? Uh, probably. Alan? Yes, I, probably. Most, right, so most people would actually walk into a haunted house and if they walk into a house that they know is actually possessed, they actually right. walk in there with an awareness that something is inside the house. Right. You, that awareness is the same type of awareness that you want to apply to the presence of the Lord. It's just coming into conscious awareness of His presence around you and in you. So you're treating Him like a person. That's why some people pray before um, conferences, come Holy Spirit, fill this place, and like that, right? Right. Well, they actually, they, 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 they don't really understand what they're doing because the Holy Spirit is already in them. What actually, pretty much the Bible refers to as being filled with the Holy Spirit is actually walking in awareness of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Wow. This is great stuff. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> so they say, come Holy Spirit. But they don't know the Holy Spirit is already there. What they really want to say is, um, let's acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit. And immediately the atmosphere will change. One time. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright? It will take place in a, in, a, in a second. For some people, it may take a few seconds. But the same, that same acknowledgement that you will give a demonic spirit if you walk into a, in a, into a home that is actually possessed, that's the same kind of acknowledgement that you want to give the presence of the Lord in you as well as the presence of the Lord in the atmosphere. Oh. This is what we're referring to here. So before you actually lay hands, I would re usually recommend that while you're laying hands, just become, just acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit and you will see miraculous things. I've seen it. I've, I have seen it time and time again. I'm going to take your word on that. I'm going to start doing that. Thank you. Yeah. So... So, does that make sense to everyone else? Actually, I plan to do the basic identity three on the presence of the Lord. So, we nail that down too. Yeah? All right. So, as I said, we will... Um, we will... Acknowledging that we fill the earth. Sensing the consuming fire on, 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 on your body. A lot of times when you do that, your body begins to get warm. You acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit. You're coming into awareness of Him. So you sense Him on your body. Right now, all of my arms, my, my body is actually feeling warm by just acknowledging His presence. So with any screen of our imagination, sorry for the interruption, but in the screen of our imaginations now, I trust that you will actually continue there in acknowledgement, in practice of, of the acknowledgement. You actually want to actually now look in, in, on the screen of your mind and, and acknowledge that no darkness can touch you because you are actually made light. Your substance is fire, white fire, white light. Your substance is holiness. No evil spirit which is unholy which an evil spirit is an unclean spirit or an unholy spirit is also called an impure spirit. So you see that all of these terms are actually being used in the New Testament. It's because that the, it's, it's because Jesus as well as the disciples, the apostles, they looked at this from the from the perspective, from the lens of holiness. So I want you to now acknowledge, even if you actually have to picture darkness fleeing from you, devils melting at great distances just because of your presence do that whilst you continue and whilst you continue to act to 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 sense the presence of the lord in your in your, on on your body in your skin in your hair sense him also in the atmosphere because that is your light holy spirit all right so your 
at this moment, feel free to unmute and comment what you're ex what you're experiencing and how this is actually impacting you at the moment. Unmute. All right, Zane. Huh? Hello. Yes, I'm. Yes, I'm Zane. I'm hearing you. Okay. Um. I, I decided to unmute because I have something else that I need to go and do. So let me just share. Okay. Um, for me, I, I saw, I, I can see myself as this light. And really and truly, you're seeing little things like, like little monkeys. And it, it's like they're scampering in all directions. Um, that's what I'm seeing. Because I, I, I see myself as total, total white light, and it, it's just shining everywhere. And as it, I, I, I just tell you, these little, they like little imps, and everybody, they, you know, like yeah, how you're putting up your hand to shield your face, and you're just running. Right. That's awesome. what I'm seeing. Awesome! 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 Anybody else? We we'll just take out at least two more. And we'd wrap up tonight. Elijah, oh, Elijah, I'm looking at Elijah's face. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jane. I know what your name uh -huh. is. Uh, <laughs> Jane, so when we first started, I was having kind of a, a weird sensation of coming in and out of it. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was there and I was acknowledged, and then I'd like come back out of it and go back in and come back out. And it was like it wasn't sustained. And so then right. I, just, I just said, that's a lie. And then it was sustained. But I think it was just, you know, a lie coming against me to tell me that this isn't for me or something like that. Because it, I don't know how to explain it really. But anyway, after, after that, it was sustained and it was very powerful. Um, I sensed the Holy Spirit inside of me, but I also just sensed that this is me. Awesome. I, yeah, no, you know what I'm saying? It's not just him inside of me. This is who I am now. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So. <laughs> that is what we're talking about. Awesome. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? All right. These are these are activations I'm actually going to leave with you all. On um next week until we we have the follow up class on Thursday, and Thursday I have some very very interesting. We have some more activations after we cover the mechanics. It's going to be. It's going to get. It's going to get um very exciting. There's going to be a lot of fun. There's some nice activations for you to just actually apply the mechanics. So I'm kindly asking that you all um take these activations, take this information, review it. Make if if you are if you for, if you may have forgotten, review it. Let it settle into your heart and mind that this is what it is. This is your substance, this is your existence, consuming fire, white consuming fire. And from there, on Thursday, I expect to hear even greater testimonies. And on Thursday, we would experiment with the mechanics of holiness. And I'm sure that you're going to have a lot of fun. All right, so that brings us to the end of this session. Would anyone else would like to give a... a, a Comment on on what how the session has impacted them and, and the experience with the activations. Thing once. All right. Well, um, John, can I pass this back on to you? Here. See who would like to pray us out. You know what, Alan, brother? I like your questions, by the way. Don't you stop? Yes, I indeed. Love, <laughs> I love questions. I love it, and I'm a big question person. Before the person even stops ta stops talking to ask, my hand is going up. <laughs> That's how we learn to grow. But would you mind praying us out? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Heavenly Father and uh, Lord Jesus and uh, Holy Spirit, uh, we just want to thank each and every one of you for uh, what you're doing through us, in us. And um, thank you for Brother Zane. Bless each and every one of us and help us to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and to be to grow in his image and in his likeness and to fulfill our destinies 
and help us to uh, to love uh, the Lord our God with all of our heart, uh, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves, and to just be uh, what we are supposed to be, sons and daughters of God. That's why we were born at this time. So thank you very much, and we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Okay.